Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to session five. This afternoon, we're very lucky to have some, um, some fascinating speakers on some great topics. Um, first up, we have uh, David Peace, who is on the advisory board of Guard Time and is a renowned uh, expert on cryptography for data integrity. Um, and then we have Robert Dory, who's CEO and co-founder of Astara, and he'll be joined for questions by William Edgerton, who is Astara's Chief Cyber Officer. Now, there's a lot to cover in this session, so I'll hand over straight away to David, who's in Hong Kong. Good evening, David. Good evening. Thank you very much. I, uh, this brief presentation um, will be about uh, about the importance of data integrity and how it will relate to uh, cyber insurance. Um, and I will touch on the, uh, the maritime industry, obviously. So if we go quickly into the next slide. Um, guard time started in Estonia. Um, Estonia was cyber attacked in 2007. Uh, and as probably most people know, Estonia is a complete digital society and digital integrity and cyber integrity is the basis of the country. And it's led to uh, data integrity being put into the military and into governments all around the world. So applying this into commercial uh, businesses uh, is really a no brainer. And that's really what uh, is happening right now and being accelerated, of course, because of recent events. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the cybersecurity triangle um, is really about perimeter breach. It's about encryption and data integrity, which I show in yellow here, is really about the actual data itself, what happens to it. It's the basis of uh, the GDPR and different regulatory acts. But essentially, as on the right, it's data provenance, really. Instead of trusting the data, um, you actually move to trust and verify which is really where we move from trust to truth. And when we have truth in our data, uh, we can actually measure it a lot better, which means for insurance, uh, we can start to quantify risk. Uh, next slide, please. So moving from, um, with large volumes of data, moving from maybe uh, the current encryption system, which has public keys uh, and uh, stored keys, uh, we move to a more hash environment uh, where, um, uh, especially in cloud environments like marine, when you're moving from ships, from satellite to ships to ports, um, where large volumes of data may render uh, encryption not so effective uh, uh, in the long term uh, into quantum computing. Uh, we, are, we are looking at a more um, nimble uh, way of uh, doing data integrity, and it's really looking at tamper-proof um, to make sure that we know what has happened from uh, the start of the data chain to the end so that we have provenance and a single version of the truth, but we're not interfering with privacy uh, and we're actually not storing um, physical valuable data uh, in that particular cryptographic chain. So this is the, the stamp that we'll see right the way through uh, in our shipping examples. Uh, next slide, please. So the idea here is to, um, to make sure that the insurance industry um, and any, any third party that needs to, see the, um, needs to see the integrity of the data can in fact see it um, uh, when, when required if something happens. So it's instead of doing just pen, uh, uh, you know, what security penetration testing, which is a point in time, but like a COVID test, it might be negative one minute and positive the next. We're basically taking a snapshot in real time of data in the cloud uh, from the whole network uh, all the time. And then putting that into a cryptographic uh, store, which is an effective blockchain. And then if we need to look at it, we'll be able to analyze that data and get a, an immutable proof of the truth of what had happened for insurance, that liability is absolutely essential. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, just flip through that, thank you. There's, let's go to the next slide so quickly. So a particular example in the shipping, um, uh, 
we worked with EY some time ago to put in the first commercial insurance where Maersk was the client, uh, where we actually looked at automating uh, all the processes in the insurance for shipping. And of course, uh, the interface to devices there is very important. So the next slide. So in, in the insurance cycle, um, from ship owner to broker, to the insurers, uh, to MERS captives, to the reinsurance cycle, we see here that these little symbols are showing that we have uh, the data tagged uh, from the start to the finish, and that uh, we can analyze that data for, for the, the truth and verify it at any time, uh, that, uh, uh, and we can authenticate uh, and validate this uh, for proof of compliance. So it also means we can do regulation in real time, uh, which um, uh, will save a lot of money uh, and help people um, uh, process business more effic uh, efficiently. Next slide, please. So I call this the IoT insurance gateway, where the various smart devices, whether they be satellite on board the ship, on shore, or uh, in the ports or uh, wherever, we'll be able to um, uh, look at the provenance from that device. We'll be able to analyze and visualize it. And then the insurance market will be able to look at it. And this will lead us to new kinds of insurance products. Uh, it will enable us to better limits. It will, be, uh, it will remove the, short, uh, the long tail from cyber insurance and uh, make us much more uh, nimble on prices and I, and I think pay out claims when people actually need it and not have long drawn out uh, claims analysis. So I'll just explain that before we close. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay, it's really moving. Yes, and uh, so this is just showing how we would uh, uh, get hold of that information from ship to shore. And, um, and uh, so here, so we, we, the information on board the ship will be, or the satellite will be taken out and put to um, um, a provenance um, a provenance system here to to analyze the data in real time next slide please and that has led us to um uh led us now for a problem that we've had uh with seafarers uh there's a company in hong kong called crew assist that has been working uh, to address the seafarer problem where there's been five hundred thousand seafarers stuck on ships extended contracts because of COVID. Uh, this has led to a lot of problems, uh, both with the, with, the, with the seafarers themselves, potential world trade, um, and you know, a risk to ships moving. And so we, we need to be able to uh, make sure we keep these seafarers moving. So we applied this technology, uh, we applied it to a digital um, QR code, uh, we put in a physical uh, we put the cryptographic stamp inside that QR code, and that is the provenance chain for the, for the seafarers so that they can safely exchange crew. This is at the moment in proof of concept, and there are several of these proof of concepts going on in the world, and uh, they are moving very nicely. Uh, next um, slide, please. And this is basically uh, gives rise to a digital health pass put out by SIGPA. SIGPA have got an ex exhibition on this uh, conference. So uh, this, is, uh, this is working technology. It's been working for a long time. Uh, it's robust and now it's been applied uh, for the COVID crisis for, for seafarers. Uh, next slide, please. So to, to wrap up here, um, this technology will enable um, us to move people from restricted seaport areas into uh, airport terminals with a universal verifier that will tell us uh, the identification of the seaman, the hospital that was authorized to do a test in this case, and the actual result of that test uh, right the way through uh, until they uh, get to their destination and then onwards again. 
and the vaccinations can then be added to this process. So next slide. And finally, this leads us to parametric insurance. Uh, we don't do a lot of parametric insurance uh, right now. We do it for weather, for catastrophes, floods and uh, earthquakes. But this will bring us into the world where we can do pre-agreed contracts because we have trusted data. We can create the triggers for those data. We can put uh, uh, contracts in place that if a certain thing happens in any of our uh, chain here, that we will trigger and pay the, uh, pay the claim. So it's not a replacement for traditional insurance, but it is going to be a very important part of uh, cyber insurance moving forwards and other intangible uh, insurances. So that's all from me. Uh, the last slide is just a benefit slide. And I, I think this makes insurers understand the risks a lot better. Uh, it means it's measurable. Um, as I say, we get a faster claim payment, much quicker analysis, uh, and uh, it, it puts in good practice for risk management. And uh, that's all I have to say. Data integrity is the key point here. Thank you. Well, David, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a fascinating topic. And I think the implications for, um, for, for change there uh, are, uh, are quite clear. And I think we also all wish you the best for the crew assist project, because this is something that's important to everybody involved in the, uh, in the shipping sector. Um, and uh, it's a great initiative. So, uh, so. It's fascinating to hear about that. Um, now I'm going to hand over to, to Robert Dory from Astara. Now, Robert needs, needs pretty much no introduction um, because of his, his experience in the maritime and the insurance world. Um, and he brings that 25 years of insurance to, uh, of experience to, um, to Astara, which is a new company, and it's focused entirely on uh, cyber insurance and risk maritime for the maritime sector. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Simon, CSO Alliance, and uh, Petro Spot for um, the invitation and a pleasure to be able to contribute. Um, so right now, we'll take you over a, a very um, eagle-eyed view of what we would describe as the Marine Cyber Challenge. Uh, next slide. Uh, we start that with, with just a quick um, look at what factors influence cyber coverage and or exclusions. Uh, essentially, um, whilst we've got four points on this slide, we can really summarize them into claims experience and market regulators. Um, claims experience um, is currently indicating um, essentially a very steady, strong uh, increase in not only the number of claims, but also the severity of claims. Uh, so that's the pinch point of severity and frequency is what causes um, underwriters and underwriting capital the most amount of stress. Uh, the evidence to support that is the IBM Cost of Data Breach Report 2020, which actually looks um, across all industries, uh, indicating that 3.9 million is the average cost of claims globally. Um, there are some notable exceptions to that, um, and clearly the size of your corporate balance sheet does drive uh, the scope for business interruption. One of the greatest sources of claims increases is ransomware. Uh, one the claim that really causes the most amount of concerns to stakeholders of all types. Stakeholders including the Office of Foreign Asset Control in the United States of America. If you're trading in United States dollars uh, or trade to the United States and OFAC takes the view that you have paid um, terrorists or you've been funding crime in the execution of a, a ransomware payment, you may well find yourself captured by the long arm of the United States uh, criminal jurisdiction. Uh, we very much take the view that ransomware claims can be avoided and they can certainly be mitigated, and, but there should be no really good reason why you should ever pay an extortion uh, claim uh, if you have a really robust backup system that's been tested and validated and routinely um, uh, enforced. Um, but I think the other element about claims experience is, is where uh, we have this concept of uh, underwriters denying coverage because the cyber in statement on a property policy um, does not in fact reinstate all risks, i.e. Uh, the case of um, uh, the non-Petia virus, which hit AP Moro as the biggest ship owner in the world, but it also hit 
a whole host of other companies costing the global um, industrial market, if I can call it that, around about $10 billion. Uh, Zurich, who was insuring a company called Mondelez, uh, did not indemnify Mondelez for a, a cost claim that they made, citing that they thought that non petia was an act of war or a warlike event, and that was not reinstated on the policy of insurance. So that leads then on to the availability of reinsurance. Do, do all underwriting capital that is invested in insurance want to support this kind of um, this risk? Are they satisfied there's the right rate of return? More often than not, with the um, spate of claims we've had, I anticipate there will be a significant reduction in available capital, uh, particularly for ransomware claims and, um, and maybe some of the business interruption that flows from that. Final point on this slide is that market regulators are becoming increasingly concerned that there is an opaque view to uh, the operation of cyber, uh, whether it's included or excluded, being defined as affirmative, or where it is silent or, um, or subject to a buyback, which is conditional. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So we believe the purpose of insurance is to achieve certainty. It's not only certainty in terms of uh, balance sheet protection, but it's certainty in terms of the transaction itself. If you are going to transfer your risk from your balance sheet into an underwriter's balance sheet, you want to be sure that you have a very clear idea of what is or is not covered. So we believe certainty can only be achieved if there is an affirmative policy of insurance where cyber is the risk peril. Um, alternatively, you also get certainty where cyber is absolutely excluded and where there is no coverage for cyber. Where you get the uncertainty is where the possibility of cover is buyback or the possibility of cover on silent cyber. Uh, clearly, silent cyber is where cyber is not mentioned positively or negatively, it's just not mentioned at all. So where you have all risk policies for ship owners, um, does that include cyber or not? And I'm afraid to say you won't know until you've had a claim as to whether or not they deem cyber to fall within that. We don't believe that is a credible position by which to offer uh, a risk transfer product. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we basically model the concept of certainty uh, in the non-affirmative and affirmative worlds by how sure are you that a claim would be paid? And we have on the lower left what we call silent cyber. So this is where you'll only know uh, when you make a claim whether or not there is coverage. Buyback arguably is, is also arguably more uncertain because even if you paid insurance premium, you still don't actually know whether it will actually respond. So I might actually have to change those two around. Uh, then you get what I describe as the affirmative policy. So there's definitely a market for what we describe as enterprise risk products. So this is where business interruption ransomware for the head office is covered, but there's no integration with the ship. There are ship only cyber policies available, but again, they don't reach into the enterprise. Um, we believe um, that where everybody needs to be is an integrated enterprise and ship cover, and that's exactly where we position ourselves. Next slide, please. Um, as a buyer of cyber insurance, what should you be looking out for? Uh, I mean, we basically split this into three buckets. Um, it's actually fundamentally more um, sort of basic, ultimately. Uh, cyber with the implementation of the IMO um, cyber guidelines uh, means that cyber is interwoven into the concept of seaworthiness. If you do not implement um, your cyber guidelines uh, within your shipping enterprise and you have a peril at sea which is caused by cyber, um, you are very likely to run into problems as to whether you can have avail yourselves of liability under the conventions or whether in fact when you trade to ports which are enforcing cyber uh, guidelines in a rather more robust fashion, and I would describe the United States as being one such example, can you evidence that you are seaworthy and that you have the requisite ticket to trade? So know your key risks is fundamental. So one of them is your ticket to trade. Others are, do you have an exposure for business interruption, loss of hire, regulatory risk, 
and so on and so forth. We know of several uh, shipping enterprises who design and build things and that intellectual property has been the subject of some theft attempts. Uh, fundamental that you mitigate risk. So test drive your uh, business continuity and disaster recovery. You should bear in mind that in the AP Muller event, it cost something like four and a half thousand dollars per computer to reinstate once it had been compromised. And then if you're a smaller risk, because you're a smaller ship owner, you might think, well, bigger ship owners, bigger risks, what's that got to do with me? Well, the reality is that smaller companies are more affected by or disproportionately affected by cyber events because they don't have the economic resilience. And therefore, the right level of coverage is, is fundamental. Go have the next slide, please. Um, we have currently 20 million of underwriting capacity delegated to us, uh, fully authorized. I won't touch on that anymore. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, but where we land end up is that we think that the, the only way to look at cyber insurance for ship owners is as one, ship and shore. That's the way that owners look at their enterprises. We don't see that insurance should operate any, any differently. Use your underwriters as a source of risk management and loss prevention as well. Uh, ultimately, if we're paying for claims, we have a very clear view about where the vulnerabilities and risks lie and can, and can help. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to get to a point where when a ship gets into trouble, it automatically, a ship owner would call their P&I club and all their hulling machinery underwriters. But if they don't know the cause, and I, it's a cyber event, we would like them to be insuring with us and to call us as the third emergency resource center. We believe that cyber is increasingly the, the root cause of events in, to come. Uh, and with that, I will conclude. Robert, thanks very much. Um, I think that you know the message is clear. There, are, there are serious implications for not having an enterprise-wide cyber posture um, that goes that goes beyond just just incorporating cyber into into the SMS. Um, uh, and and these are these are key issues. And I think very interesting as well about buyback and uh, and silent coverage. Um, the, these the I mean, who wants to buy insurance where where you're not sure whether you're going to get a payout or not. Um, so, so there are some there are some serious issues there. We've had some questions here um, to address, uh, and I'd like to bring uh, William Edgerton into uh, into this. Bill, you've been you've been working in cyber for perhaps twenty five odd years, um, and uh, when people think about the maritime cyber environment, they're often thinking that it's perhaps not as mature as other sectors. What what would you say to that? Is the is the transportation sector? How does it measure up against other sectors? Do you think? I think um, every sector is interested to know where they stand in the in the league table of infamy. And I think the uh, with 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 transportation, um, if you read IBM, it's tenth in terms of the average size of claims. If you read a colleague speaking earlier today, they were fifth according to number of breaches and number of attacks. I think the issue is really uh, not one of where people stand in the league table, but they know what they're going to do if there's been if there's an attack. They know how to deal with it. I think. Comparisons are odious and don't teach you very much. Um, but all you need to know is that attacks are getting more sophisticated and happening in greater numbers. So I think, you know, let's worry about ourselves first without worrying about what healthcare is doing. And so, and and Robert, do you think that that good cyber risk management, does that improve if if it's if your if your cyber risk management is in good shape? Does that impact on other areas of insurance coverage that you might have? Uh, in our view, undoubtedly. Um, if you're a publicly listed shipping operation or you rely heavily on corporate investment, uh, either to finance your ships or finance your operation, uh, a lot of professional investors are concerned as to the cyber risk that sits within their own investment portfolio, like what can affect the value of their investment. Um, so that's if you can evidence that you've undertaken a risk management and that the directors of a company are either buying insurance or purposely not buying insurance, uh, they will be able to demonstrate good risk management. And the point about that is it gives less risk to the critical stakeholders or the financiers of the business. Uh, another really good example is directors and officers liability. 
you have a cyber event which leads to a business interruption, if there is no business interruption insurance, the people that foot the loss are the shareholders. And therefore, they mark down the value of a company as a result. Uh, very often, you'll see those shareholders bring claims against the directors and officers of the shipping enterprise or any enterprise for that matter that has the loss. And those <clears throat> that difference in share price will be sought and claimed against those um, directors. And if there's directors and officers side C uh, cover, then that would, in most cases, pay out. So there is there is a benefit to other insurers and other stakeholders and to the company in managing cyber risk properly. And is there is there a, you talked about buyback before? Uh, what are the implications for? I mean, there are there there are cyber exclusion clauses in in all sorts of policies. So what are the implications for those cyber exclusion clauses? Does it does it? Uh, what I'm what I'm saying is is there. Is there a need to have buyback or is it is it redundant because there are so many different policies? Um, that's a good question. I think the cyber marine market has been evolving over the last four years. I think it'd be fair to say with various products coming on. Of course, people start with a, a narrow appetite. They rely heavily on reinsurance or they rely on other people to underwrite the risk. So you're really driven by that appetite as to what you can really offer. I think up until relatively recently, um, and we would say certainly with the ad advent of uh, Astara, there had not been any broader form, reasonable proposition that they could otherwise buy. So I think, you know, we won't be the first, or we, are, we may be the first, but we certainly won't be the last. And and David, if I can turn to you, when you talked about um, you talked about a, a data integrity approach. Now, when when that is adopted, and if, if and as and when it does get adopted in in a more in a wider sense, what change? How how will that change the um, the current approach to insurance and the status quo? Right. So I think it's going to be a significant shift. Um, what we are doing is we are wrapping financial assurance with operational assurance. And it's going to lead to uh, better underwriting parameters because it's data driven. For a start, we're going to get actual real risk data. We're not going to have to rely on forecasted data. The data will be actual risk data. Uh, it'll be granular and we'll be able to provide real time alerts uh, as well as to what has happened and also prevention. Uh, in some cases, configurations can be checked ahead of time, and if they're wrong, they can be corrected. So we are adding um, several new uh, underwriting parameters to this, and that will lead to certain parametric solutions uh, that will address some of the problems that Rob mentioned in his presentation. So I, I think it's going to raise the bar for underwriting, and it's not going to disrupt because you're just adding another layer to existing architectures of proven technology in the defense, military, and other verticals already using this. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's fascinating what the change you know what the change could be. Um, and and Bill, I'd like to just give you uh, the, perhaps the last word. I think on in in terms of we heard from Walter early on in the last session about the change of culture that um, that V ships that he's instigated in V ships. The, the, uh, a lot of our members and a lot of shipping companies aren't the same size as V-ships. What would you say to the small companies that say that risk management is our business? So why does this affect us? What would you say to them? Oh, you're on mute, Bill. Bill, you're on mute. Yeah, I got it. One, one thing is the, uh, just because you're small doesn't mean you're invisible and therefore uh, on the net and therefore you have to take precautions just as anybody would to keep your data secure and to keep your networks functional. The, the issue obviously for smaller companies is depth of pocket and you know, it's expensive relatively to, for them to, to adopt uh, good cyber hygiene compared to the big guys. But nonetheless, it's an important consideration. I think also the uh, smaller companies need to realize that you know, they, are, you know, they can benefit from the experience of the larger companies. If they're working with them, there will be requirements placed on them obviously to, to keep their data secure if uh, if they are contracting to a large company which will obviously help them and they, they can probably get some help from their from their uh, customers in doing some of this if their customers are more enlightened because they recognize the importance of integrity in the supply chain 
Um, but I also think that, you know, smaller companies, you know, need to think about wider issues such as insurance for this kind of thing. Because if you get taken out of business for, and you haven't got the diversity of, of uh, business opportunity, a, a breach will hurt you more and could drive you under very quickly. So I think that looking at um, all sorts of risk management measures to ensure your, your operation can continue despite being attacked is really fundamental. And that needn't be over, overly complex either. In a small business, you know your main systems, you know what worries you most, you know what will knock you off course. And I think it's taking that priority and saying, right, what is really fundamental to us? What do we absolutely need to be able to do? Is it bookings or is it delivery? Well, you know, you, t you take your pick and you, and you work accordingly. Sometimes, you know, the booking system can be more, pr more difficult to uh, combat against because people will go elsewhere. So if you can ensure you can continue to take bookings, even though your fulfillment's a bit delayed, it's better than not taking any bookings at all. Well, thanks, Bill. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up there. It's been a, it's been a really interesting session, uh, and it just remains for me to thank David Peace and uh, Robert Dory and Bill Edgerton, uh, and thank you all very much. And if there are any more questions that we haven't addressed, then please do um, please do send them onto the platform, and we'll do our best to get them answered. Thanks all very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.